appreciate your earnest spirit. I appreciated the remarks of my colleagues in the Sabbath School lesson this morning, the contributions they made that give evidence of an understanding of the Adventist message, what it's all about. This morning, I would like to invite you to share with me a problem that I had in Africa years ago. The problem was that I had so much and the Africans had so little. I had a suit of clothes to wear. Often they had rags, nothing more. I had a pair of shoes to wear and they went barefooted. I had good food to eat and most of them had nothing but posho, matoki, a few things like that. I was able to finish college and many of these African young people couldn't even pay school fees to go to grade school, let alone high school. And as I was driving to the camp meetings, for example, driving along those dusty roads, and I would come across our people who were walking to the camp meeting, carrying their blankets and their bedding and their pots and pans on their heads and on their backs. As I would drive by in my big, long, luxurious motor car, my Volkswagen Bug, these poor people would have to run for the bushes and cover their heads with these blankets because of the clouds of dust that my car was raising. And my car was the only one that was parked at these camp meetings. A few of them had bicycles, most of them would walk barefooted. And here I was coming around preaching to these people about the importance of sacrificing and paying tithes and giving offerings to God's cause, etc. How would you feel if your pastor drove around to visit you and pled with you to give more to your church expense fund, for example, and is driving a $200,000 gold-plated Rolls Royce? That is somehow how I felt with these Africans. It bothered me. They were my brothers and my sisters. And I kept wondering why God has given me so much and given them so little. And then I discovered what has become my favorite Bible text. And everywhere I go, I love to share this text with you. And I hope that you will learn to love this as I do. It's a text that will straighten out the crooked things in your life, that will answer your questions, that will unravel your confusion. I believe it's the only answer to the conflict between capitalism and Marxism, which is a very real problem in the third world. And I believe that my favorite Bible passage will put your life into sharp focus and give you a joy and a purpose in living. It'll help you discover what your new name is. Nobody here this morning knows what his name is even. There's a new name God has for us. It'll help you discover who you are and how important you are in God's plan, and I'm not exaggerating. I think this passage is really the Mount Everest of Scripture. It's 2 Corinthians 5, and verses 14 and 15. And I'd like to examine this passage this morning, first of all, with a telescope, so we can understand the context, the reason why Paul has said these words. And secondly, with a microscope, examining the words minutely to discover what they actually mean. But to get the setting, with our telescope, first of all, let's go back to verse 13. The problem is that Paul has been accused of being beside himself, of having lost his mind, of, having, of being irrational. For example, in chapter 11, just keep your finger there and take a look briefly. 
he describes the sufferings that he's been through as a servant of Christ. Verse 24 of the Jews, five times. I received 40 stripes, save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods. Once was I stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I've been in the deep. In journeys often, in perils of waters, of robbers, mine own countrymen, by the heathen, in the city, in the wilderness, in the sea, among false brethren, in weariness, painfulness, watching, hunger, thirst, fastings, cold, and nakedness. And this went on decade after decade. And Paul has become an old man now. And his friends are telling him, Paul, why don't you retire? Why don't you get a little villa by the Mediterranean and settle down and grow roses and, and have a nice time? You deserve it. You've put in your stint already. Let the younger men bear the burden. you worked long enough. And Paul is replying to the, this charge because he cannot stop. He cannot retire. He's got to keep going. And Paul kept on going until that day in the Mamertine prison when the Roman soldier knocked on the door. He said, Paul, would you follow me outside, please? And Paul knew what this meant. We're told it was a bright summer day. And as he walked out in the, under the bright blue sky of summer, Paul knew what was coming. And the soldier said, Paul, would you mind laying your head on that block there, please? As the knife fell, and the shadows gathered around Paul's mind, his last thought was this verse, what it teaches him. It says, whether we be beside ourselves, it's to God, or if we're sober, it's for your cause. The explanation is this, the love of Christ constrains us. And then Paul, typically, with his brilliant mind and his warm heart, the combination is wonderful. Paul could reason logically. He works out an equation here, a logical equation which is more than emotionalism. Emotionalism is good, I'm sure, in its place. But there should be some objective truth, some logic on which it rests. And Paul has both of them here. He says, we thus judge that if one, capital O, should be, if one died for all, then were all dead. And I think the King James comes about the closest to any of the translations in stating what Paul meant, but it's not perfect itself. What he says there is, he's reasoned it out thus, that if one died for all, then if that one had not died for all, all would be dead in their grave. And so it dawned on Paul's consciousness the fact of Christ dying upon the cross for all really means that all that Paul could claim as his was that grave. I sometimes ask my congregations in Africa, can you tell me, what do I have that really belongs to me? And they put their hands up, oh yes, I know, Pastor, that nice suit of clothes you have on. I say, no. I wasn't born with this. It's not really mine. Could lose it today. Well, the money in your pocket. No, not one penny that I have is mine, really. Well, your life is yours. Say, no way. My life is a gift of God's grace. Oh, I know, Pastor, your character. I say, you're dead wrong. 100%. My righteousness is all of Christ. All imputed, not one percent is mine. It's all of Christ. Imputed or imparted, it's all of Christ. Well, your education, that's something you have up here that no one can take from you. I say, no, my education was a gift of God's grace. My dear brother helped me to get it. My parents helped me to get it. I don't deserve a bit of it. There's one thing that is mine, though. 
100%. And they were baffled. They didn't know what that was. And I told them, the one thing which is mine, which I've earned, every inch of it is mine, is my grave. And that's all that I have. That's what Paul saw. When he saw the cross, he had nothing of his own. Talk about sacrifice. The word ceases to exist for the one who sees the cross of Calvary. And so in verse 15 he says, this equation has taught me something. He died for all, the day who lived. And I'm going to give you now, if I may, my own translation from the Greek. I think this is what it says. The day who lived shall henceforth find it impossible to go on living for themselves. Now they're constrained to live unto him who died for them and rose again. Now I think this passage here is the clearest, I know anywhere, to explain what is genuine righteousness by faith. That's the setting. Now let's look at it a little more closer with our, with our microscope and try to examine these words minutely. What does the word constrain mean? Now, you people are very sophisticated people, and I could not do before you what I do before the Africans when I explain this. But I have several elders sitting here on the platform with me. Maybe they're big, heavy, strong men. And I say, now, elder, would you just sit back and relax and enjoy yourself? Fine, he sits back and relaxes. Then I walk up and I grab him by the wrist and I yank him out of his seat and I whirl him around and I shove him down the aisle. And of course, by this time, the people are laughing. And I tell them, that's what the word constrain means. I don't mean to imply that it moves you against your will. That's really not what I'm trying to say because God doesn't do that to any of us. Even love doesn't do that to any of us, really. But it does motivate us as nothing else under the universe can motivate us. It picks us up and it moves us. The word restrain means to hold back. And the word constrain means to push forward. And so Paul says, all this work that I've been doing, all these long missionary safaris, all these beatings, these imprisonments, this fasting, this nakedness, this cold, these shipwrecks, the stonings, everything is nothing. I've done nothing of myself. The love of Christ has constrained me every inch of the way because Paul saw the cross of Calvary, what it meant. Let's take our microscope and look again. Another word, the word love. The love of Christ constrains us, he says. What does that word mean? Now we have in English only one word for love. In German, there's only one word. In French, only one word. In Swahili, only one word. But the Greeks had more than one word for love. The Greek language was very flexible. And there were two words that became, through the centuries, outstanding contestants in a great battle, a great controversy between two ideas of love. In fact, the great controversy between Christ and Satan, rightly understood, is this controversy between these two ideas of love. Babylon is built upon one concept of love, and the remnant church is built upon an entirely different concept of love. And friends, I say humbly, in the fear of God, I don't think any of us can really understand what it means to be a Seventh-day Adventist in this time of the cleansing of the heavenly sanctuary unless we understand the issue. 
The ordinary everyday word for love was eros among the Greek people. And although we have some derivatives today that have a sexual connotation, in the days of Plato and the Greek philosophers, eros was not exclusively a sexual love. Plato envisioned what he called a heavenly eros, a beautiful, noble concept. He thought that God was eros that would lift the world up out of this swamp of sensuality and get people on the way up to heaven, you see. This was his heavenly eros, a beautiful, noble, spiritual, philosophical concept. And eros became, of course, the everyday word for love. It included the love of husband for wife and vice versa, the love of parents for their children, vice versa, the love of friends for each other. It also included man's love for God. And the ancients thought that God was Eros. Beautiful concept and noble. But when the Apostle Paul took his pen to write these words, and when John took his pen to write that sublime equation, God is love, in 1 John 4, 8, the apostles could not say that God is Eros. They just couldn't say it. But they chose to use a second Greek word that had become rather obscure, that wasn't used too often. And they injected this obscure word with a meaning that was utterly beyond itself. And that word became the word that turned the world upside down. The word was agape. Paul says, the agape of Christ constraineth us. Now, our ordinary word for love can't do that because we're so confused by that word today. It means everything from Hollywood's barnyard immorality to the nature of God sitting upon his throne. All of that is included in this one word, love. A sentimental, hazy, nebulous idea in many people's minds, we sing about it, and we go blah, blah, we don't know what we're singing about sometimes, even. It's, it's a concept that's not clear. Agape is clear. And I want you to understand it today by the grace of God. There are seven outstanding contrasts I would like to touch on between these two ideas of love. And please remember that throughout the ages there's been a controversy raging between these two ideas. Roman Catholicism is built upon a synthesis of eros and agape. And Augustine, the father of Roman Catholic theology, worked out the synthesis. He called it in Latin caritas. And from that we have our King James word charity in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Luther came along and began to break up the synthesis. Luther understood the nature of man. You see, it's impossible to understand what agape love is if you believe in the natural immortality of the soul. And Luther believed in the, nat in the natural mortality of the soul. A man was by nature mortal. And Luther did begin to perceive the dimensions of this grand agape. But as soon as Luther died, his followers, Melanchthon and the others, reverted back to the old pagan papal doctrine of natural immortality, and they lost the concept of agape. The Wesleys almost recovered it. But it wasn't until a little woman came along in 1844 and 45, and thereafter began to write, and I say this humbly. It wasn't until she came along that her agape came into his own. Her writings are permeated with the concept, though she never actually penned the word itself. First of all, in contrast, our human love is eros. We're born with it. Everybody gets it by natural birth, and he has it as standard equipment. Our human love is a love 
which is based upon or is dependent upon the quality or the, or let me say, the beauty or the goodness of its object. For example, a young man wants to get married and he's looking for a girl. He finds one who turns him on, someone who to him is beautiful, charming, just what he's been dreaming of, and he falls in love. His love slumbers until his love is aroused by an object which is beautiful or good. Our human love, which is eros, can never stand sovereign, free, and independent. It is always dependent upon something good or something beautiful. In contrast, God's agape is sovereign, free, independent. It is not dependent upon the goodness or the beauty of its object. And therefore, God can love ugly people and bad people. Turn to Romans chapter 5 and you'll see it. Romans chapter 5. And incidentally, we have here a reference to a story that the ancient Greeks would tell. And unless you understand that story, you don't really get, get the point of what Paul is saying here. In verse 7, Scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet maybe, peradventure, for a good man, some would even dare to die. Now the Greeks had this story, I found this story incidentally, in the library at the University of Nairobi in Africa. There was a young man, a young Greek man, whose name was Alcestis. He was tall, I'm sorry, Admetus, of course, Admetus. He was tall, handsome, a good young man, capable, good character. And something went wrong, and uh, he went to the gods on Mount Olympus and asked them what was wrong. And the gods said, you're doomed to die unless someone can be found who will die in your place. And so his friends went around, this one and that one, would you die for Admetus? And they said, well, we think he's a wonderful young man, but sorry, we couldn't die for him. They came to his parents, would you die for your son? Well, we love him very much, but uh, sorry, we couldn't die for him. Then they came to his girlfriend. Her name was Alcestis. Some of the stories say she was his wife, but it doesn't matter. She loved him, and she admired him. And Alcestis said, because he is such a noble young man, so tall, so handsome, so good, so wise. Yes, the world needs him. Yes, I will die for Admetus. And the Greek said, hooray, we found it. This is it. This is the apex of love that someone is willing to die for a good man. Can you imagine their consternation when the apostles came along and said, that's not it at all. That's not love. Verse 8, God commendeth his agape toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, verse 10, enemies, Christ died for us. Number two, our human loves we have as standard equipment is a love that feels it must seek after God. And I told you that eros is a beautiful, noble, spiritual concept. And the ancient pagan Greeks used to build their temples up from the tops of the highest hills, like the Acropolis in Athens. You climbed up all those steps to get to the temple up there, seeking after God. God was playing hide-and-seek with people, and only those who were intellectually acute, who were persevering, Noble in their aspirations could hope to succeed in finding him. This is Eros. The Roman Catholics go to Rome seeking after God. The Muslims go to Mecca seeking after God. And 
not suppose that the Seventh-day Adventists go to camp meetings seeking after God. But it's an Eros idea. The idea is that God is hiding from you. That God is like a doctor. I don't know about your doctors in Australia, but over in America, if you want to see a doctor, you can't call up and say, look, I want to see the doctor this morning, please. The nurse will say, well, just a minute. Hang on, just a minute. Let me just check here. Let's see. Today is what? July 20? Is that right? Uh, well, let's look here. Yes, we can fit you in August 13, okay? You see? And if you go down to see the doctor, you can't get in. There's a bunch of nurses out there to keep you out. And way back in his sanctum sanctorum sits the doctor in lordly grandeur, waiting for you to seek him out. Now, I've never known of a doctor who takes his bag of medicines and goes around from door to door, knocking on the door. Anybody sick here? Can I help anybody? You see? Eros is man seeking after God. Agape is the opposite. Turn to Luke 19 and verse 10. Agape is God seeking after man. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. You can read your Bible from Genesis to Revelation. You will find no parable of a lost sheep that must go out looking for his shepherd. But you will read of a good shepherd who is out looking for his sheep. And somehow I wish we could teach our young people this truth. Because they have the idea, many of them, that God is really playing hide and seek with them. That God couldn't care less if they don't find him. It's up to them. If you've got the stamina, if you've got the backbone, if you've got the grit and the determination and the strength of character to seek after God till you find him, you'll be saved. If you don't have, poor you. Bye-bye. And God stands back with his arms folded and says, well, I hope you make it, but if you don't, I won't be surprised. A lot of people don't. That's not our Lord. He is the good shepherd out looking for his sheep. When you get home, read Romans 10. We don't have time to do it now. The whole chapter is agape, about God seeking after us. And your job and my job is not to seek after him, but to say, Lord, here I am, you found me. Praise God. Number three, our human love is a love which by nature depends upon the quality of its object. What I mean is this. We all tend to put people in pigeonholes, and we sort them out. We bow and scrape to the mayor, but we don't bow and scrape to the garbage man, do we? But we have people in different categories. We invite people home for lunch who can probably invite us back for lunch sometime. And this is natural to us. In Africa, we have the bride price system. The young man wants to marry a girl, and if she's never been to school and can barely write her name in the sand or barely make two and two out to be four, he pays so many cows as the dowry for this girl. But if this girl has been to school and maybe finished the eighth grade, then he's got to pay a lot more cows. And if she's finished high school, then it's getting pretty expensive to marry a girl like that. And if perchance this girl has gone away to England, to Cambridge or Oxford, comes back with a degree, forget her. <laughs> Unless you are a politician with your Mercedes Benz, you see. And our system is not all that different, you know. We, we say that water finds its own level, you know. We tend to, to pair off somewhat the same way in our customs as well. This is our natural human love, dependent upon the quality of its object. Agape is the opposite. It's more than opposite. Agape is dynamic. Agape creates value in its object. Isaiah 13 and verse 12. The prophet says, the Lord is speaking through him, I'll make a man more precious than fine gold, even a man than the golden wedge of Ophir. God delights to take somebody who's down and out, lying in a gutter, 
somebody who's hopeless. And when this agape gets into his heart, God loves to see that person transformed into someone equivalent in value to his own son. It's hard to say it, but it's true. I remember we had an experience in Kenya. During the Mau Mau, we weren't allowed to go out preaching. All we could do was to use a Bible correspondence course. The post office was still open, so we used it. And unknown to us, a Mau Mau Oath administrator got hold of our lessons and was impressed with the truth and gave his heart to the Lord. And then he came to hear me deliver this same sermon on Agape one Sabbath morning. He was so impressed that he inquired when I would preach it again. And I was preaching it in different churches here and there in Kenya. He would pedal his bicycle from church to church, Sabbath after Sabbath, till he heard this message probably six or seven times, until the idea of agape got under his skin. Now this Mau Mau Oath administrator was the kind of a man you wouldn't want to meet at midnight in some dark alley. Snaggletooth, harsh looking, you'd, you'd, have been, you'd have run. But I want to tell you, this man has become a soul winner, a gospel preacher, a call pointer, and people call him the Billy Graham of Kenya. God's agape creates value in his own. God doesn't love me because of my goodness. He loves me because he's a God. But his love creates something in my soul. Our human love is always acquisitive in nature. It wants to get something for itself. We think of getting a reward for serving the Lord. And we sing this song, Will there be any stars in my crown? And we teach the children to sing, I shall wear a crown in my father's house. If you want to sing it, go ahead. I refuse to sing it. If any angel tries to give me a crown, I hope I won't be stupid enough to accept it. How could I? I could only cast it down at the feet of him who deserves it. I think the important thing is not that we get a crown but that we help to crown him king of kings, the Lord of all. Now, in contrast to our human love, which is acquisitive, God's love gives. It's self-emptying, 2 Corinthians 8, verse 9. You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Though he was rich, yet for your sake, he became poor that ye through his poverty might be made rich. There's a joy in giving. There's a joy in relinquishing reward for ourselves. And agape constrains us to that joy. And then, number five. Sometimes the Africans have said to me, uh, Pastor, we want you to show us agape. We want to see it. I've always said, don't look at me. I am not your example. I am a poor, lost sinner being saved by grace. But if you want to see agape, turn to Philippians chapter 2. You'll see it. Philippians chapter 2. Our human love is a kind of a love that always wants to climb up higher. For example, a child in the second grade or second standard always wants to go into standard three, right? Have you ever seen a child in standard four who wants to go back to standard one? I haven't. And when I ask a little boy or little girl, how old are you? They'll almost never tell me how old they are. They will always say, I will be six my next birthday, or I'll be seven my next birthday. You see? It's always climbing up higher. Politicians are that way. I don't know what you're like in Australia, but we have politicians in America. And the state senator always wants to be a national senator. 
And I suppose every national senator who goes to Washington at some time dreams that he might make it to the White House. We've never had a United States president who voluntarily, willingly, gladly resigned his presidency to come down and be a dog catcher in some little village someplace. That doesn't happen. The move is always upward, you see. And even in the church, we're playing by this era concept. The path of a small church wants to get a bigger church. And the path of a big church wants to be the conference president, perhaps. And the conference president would like to be what? The union president. Or what, you know? And it's very, very seldom you ever find a high official who is willing and happy to get out and be a plain, ordinary, bottom-of-the-ladder pastor. It just doesn't happen very often, does it? Agape is the opposite. Agape is willing to step down lower. And we have here in Philippians 2, verses 5 to 8, what is probably an outline of Paul's favorite sermon. And Paul never spent, like I have to do, five minutes on, on this. He loved to dwell on this, Ellen White tells us. He might even spend hours on it. The people sat there listening. They forgot who they were. They forgot where they were. They saw something before their eyes, and the tears rolled down their cheeks. And they said, if the Son of God came from heaven all the way down to this world for me, here, I give myself and all I have to him. No thought of going to heaven, no thought of a reward, no thought of escaping hell. It was the constraint of God's agape that motivated him. But notice now in this passage, if you listen carefully, seven steps that Jesus took in stepping down lower. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, the very highest place, step number one, counted not equality with God a thing to be grasped at. That's the first step. They tell us uneasy lies ahead that wears a crown. Many a king and many a president on his bed at night lies there with a furrowed brow, worrying about he might lose his high position. The first step that Jesus did was he counted not his highest place of equality with God to be something to hang on to. Step number two, verse seven, but emptied himself or made himself of no reputation. A man will fight to the death for his reputation. A man is willing to die physically, willing to be shot, whatever, if only he can leave a good reputation. And if somebody slanders our reputation, that stirs us up more than anything else, practically. They can steal our goods, but to steal our good name, that's what we can't stand. But Jesus made himself no reputation. And that might be a step we need to learn ourselves to take. Number three, he took upon him the form of a slave. That's what the Greek word means. Now, had he become an angel, had he stepped down to that level, that would have been a great condescension because all the angels are ministering spirits sent forth to minister to those who shall be heirs of salvation. And if Christ had said, well, I'm going to step down to the level of an ordinary angel, and then I'll go on missions of mercy to the world and try to help people as an angel, that would have been a great condescension. But no, he stepped still lower than that. Step number four, he was made in the likeness of men. And that word likeness is interesting, by the way. 
It's exactly the same dative construction as you have in Romans 8, 3, that he was sent in the likeness of our sinful flesh. It means the reality of likeness, not unlikeness. Christ truly became man. He was 100% human, as well as being 100% God. But he didn't come as Adam was before the fall, more than twice as tall as people now living, with the brain that could remember everything. He didn't have to carry a pencil with him like I do and write notes down. He could remember everything, fantastic capacities. He could run beautifully, never get tired. No, he didn't come like that. He waited, we're told, 4,000 years. So the human race had degenerated terribly. And even though the world today is corrupt and wicked, I think we have to recognize that not yet has the world sunk again to the level that it was back in the days when Jesus came. The Roman Empire was a swamp of depravity, unmentionable depravity. I will mention one thing just to let you know what, I'm, what reality is. I don't know of any restaurant in the world today, like the restaurants they used to have in ancient Rome when Jesus came. You went and you ate and ate and ate and ate, and then you visited a portion of the restaurant known as the vomitorium. Then you came back and ate again. And with all of modern man's depravity, I don't know that any place quite as bad as that. And at this lowest level of human degradation, Christ became one of us. That's not all. Verse 8, step number 5. Being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself. He could have been born in Caesar's palace in Rome, but no, he chose not to be. He could have been born at least in the high priest's palace in Jerusalem where the wise men from the east expected to find him. But no, he wasn't born there. I've asked my congregations, I'm going to ask you, was anybody in this congregation here today, was anybody here born in a stable with the cows and the chickens and the goats? Anybody? Do I see a hand? No, not a single hand. One time, somebody raised his hand in Kenya and said, yes, I was born in a stable with the cow, the chicken, and the goat. That's where Jesus was born. And it wasn't December 25 when we have winter in the northern hemisphere. It was probably summer, late summer, early autumn. There were flies everywhere. Which of you mothers would like to have a baby in a cow pen? And it flies all over your baby's eyes and nose and his ears. The Virgin Mary must have told him something about it. Because we have in Psalm 22 a transcript as though a secretary were present taking down his meditation as he hung on the cross. And he recalls his birth in the stable. He said, I was cast upon thee from the womb. His mother told him, Jesus, you would have died if God had to save you. It was terrible. Terrible. And so thankful you didn't die there in the stable with the cows and the chickens and the goats and all those flies around. He remembered. That wasn't all. Step number six, he became obedient unto death. No suicide is obedient unto death. A suicide is disobedient, trying to evade reality, to run away from facing reality. To be obedient unto death is to face reality. 
and he faced the reality of sin and guilt. Step number six. But that's not all. But step number seven. Even the death of the cross. What does that mean? We hang crosses on our walls and we wear them around our necks with little gold ornaments. Put them up on the steeples of our churches. The cross is a symbol of glory to us. But what was the death of the cross? You say, well, that was a pretty bad thing. It was having nails driven through your hands and through your feet. And you're strung up naked before this crowd of laughing people. That's pretty bad. Yes, it is bad. I wouldn't want to endure it even for a minute. But that's not the death of the cross. It's not what it means. There have been many soldiers in battle who have been wounded with shrapnel or bullets or swords who have lain on the battlefield in agony for hours and hours and days, far longer than Christ hung upon his cross, from 9 o'clock in the morning until only 3 o'clock in the afternoon. The physical agony, not the death of the cross, not even the shame of being strung up naked before a crowd of people. There was something else involved in the death of the cross. And to understand that, you've got to go to Galatians to see it. Galatians chapter 3, and verse 13. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it's written, now he's quoting from Deuteronomy 21, verse 23, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. Now, what happened was that Moses had declared, and look, go back, will you, to Deuteronomy 21, so you can see it for yourself. Deuteronomy 21, the last two verses. If a man have committed a sin worthy of death, and he be to be put to death, and thou hang him on a tree, his body shall not remain all night upon the tree but thou shalt in any wise bury him that day, for he that is hanged on a tree is cursed of God. Now what that means was this, in plain language. If you have been accused of a crime and you've been found guilty and the judge says, I sentence you to die by having your head chopped off, you can be happy. You can say, thank you, your honor. You can go back to your cell. You can kneel down upon your knees. You can pray. God will hear you, and God will forgive you, and you can die with the hope of a resurrection. And if the judge says, I sentence you to die having a sword thrust through your heart, you can say, thank you, your honor. You can pray for forgiveness. You can have the assurance that God loves you. God respects you. You can die in hope of a resurrection. But if the judge says, I sentence you to die upon a tree, you've had it. You cannot pray. God will not hear you. You are a curse of God. Now, don't blame me for that. I didn't say it. Moses said it, and everybody believed it. And that is why when Pilate asked the Jews, what then shall I do with this man? Jesus. They didn't say, well, exile him to Spain or send him far off to Britain, something like that. They didn't say that. They didn't say uh, stone him or even to behead him. They had one idea only, crucify him. Get him on a tree and let's prove to the world that we're right in condemning him. Because it is impossible, they said, that any Messiah of God could possibly die upon a tree. And the moment these Jews, these Sanhedrin members, saw the Roman soldiers come with their hammer and their nails, and they drove the nails through his hands and feet and strung him up on the tree, they were so happy. They went around uh, hitting each other on the back and shaking hands. We made the right decision this morning. I had some misgivings, you know. 
I was afraid maybe we were wrong. Maybe this man might possibly be the true Messiah. But now I know we were right because the great Moses said, anybody who's hanged upon a tree is automatically a curse of God. And don't tell me that Jesus didn't feel it. Don't tell me that Jesus was so wise that he saw through this. Because on that cross, he felt himself a curse of God. He cried out, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Hope did not present to him his coming forth, the conqueror from the tomb. He could not see through the portals of the grave. And with deep reverence, I say, on the cross, Christ went to hell. He died the equivalent of the second death. And that is a gospel. That's how far it goes. Number six, our human love is merely self-love. That's all it is. It's sad to say we have preachers we have books that tell us we ought to learn to love self. Shame on us. The Bible nowhere teaches the love of self. The words of Jesus are misconstrued when he said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. It didn't mean that you must now learn to love self and, and uh, participate in this great number one game that we have today. It didn't mean that. He meant as by nature you find it easy to love yourself. So now love your neighbor instead. That's what he meant. Agape is this emptying of self. But I want, I, I want to come now to number seven. And this is my closing point. And leave this with you. Our human love is a love. And please get ready now. You may want to disfellowship me and put me on a plane back to America when I say this. Our human love is the kind of a love that wants to go to heaven and wants to walk the golden streets and wants to drink the water of life and eat the fruit of the tree of life and have a beautiful mansion there on Main Street to get a great reward. You may say, well, Pastor, that's why I'm keeping the Sabbath. That's why I was baptized. Because I want to go to heaven. I don't want to go to hell. I want a reward. That's why I'm working. They're pastors and evangelists who work their fingers ends off almost, baptizing people, get a great reward. Look at all the stars and the crown and so on. But this egocentric, this self-centered motivation is error. Agape is the kind of a love that dares to go to hell. You may say, well, that's okay. I think I can see that, that Christ on the cross died not the first death, but the equivalent of the second death. As Isaiah says, he poured out his soul unto death. It's okay for Christ to do that, and I'm very glad he did. But me, me, I could never have a love like that. So I want to tell you a story about a man who did have love like that. And the story is back here in Exodus, chapter 32. And the man's name was Moses. A man who was born in sin, exactly like you and I are born in sin. Who had a sinful nature like you and I do have. Israel have sinned the great sin. They've made them a god of gold or golden calf. They've broken the covenant. They've knelt down to worship this calf and rose up to play and so on. And the Lord is angry. And the Lord says in verse 9, I have seen this people that's a stiff-necked people. In verse 10, in modern language, to translate it in modern language, the Lord says, now Moses, get out of the way. Get out of the way. I'm going to drop an H-bomb on the whole camp of Israel and just wipe them out like that. They won't know what hit them. It's not going to hurt. 
We'll just wipe them out of existence. And then, Moses, I'm going to start from scratch with you and build a new nation, a new people. They'll no longer talk about the children of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It'll now be the children of Moses. But Moses, I can't do it while you're standing there. Get out of the way. What does Moses do? Thank you, Lord. Appreciate the honor. Great idea. We read here in verse 31 that Moses returned to the Lord and prayed. Oh, this people have sinned, the great sin, and have made them gods of gold. Yet now, if thou wilt forgive their sin. And here you have the only dash in the entire Bible. When I was learning English in high school, my teacher taught me, use the dash very sparingly in your composition, your writing. And the Lord did, one time only. And Moses breaks down and saw. And how long he knelt there before he got his voice back, I don't know. But when he finally got his voice to continue his prayer, he prayed, if not, blot me, I pray thee, out of thy book, which thou hast written. You get the point? That is a gospel. The Apostle Paul had the same agape. Romans 9, verse 1, he says, I could wish myself accursed from Christ if I could just save my fellow Jews. This is love. So do you see why the Apostle Paul said the agape of Christ constrains us? It picks us up. It moves us. It's almost like we can't help ourselves. We're driven by this agape to give all we have, even, even eternity if necessary, to save our fellow man and to honor the one who died for us. I'm sure your heart would like to respond to this love. So I'm going to invite you to respond in song by singing number 280. But, when I say that, I'd like to add immediately a request. And that is, please don't sing it unless you mean it. I think it's a terrible thing for us to sing these songs thoughtlessly and carelessly. It's hypocrisy. And the Lord would be happy for us to be silent than for us to say something that we don't really mean deep in our hearts. Many young people find difficulty understanding the old English word feign. Beneath the cross of Jesus I feign would take my stand, let me suggest that we translate it into modern English, beneath the cross of Jesus I choose to take my stand, okay?